Okay, this is slab three in our 1920s unit on entertainment. Um, with people having lots of money, they do lots of things with it. They not only buy things, but they do things entertainment-wise. Um, and one of the new forms of entertainment, in fact, the new form of home entertainment, was radio. Um, the first radio station, local station, um, was in Pittsburgh, 1920, KDKA Radio, KDKA in Pittsburgh in 1920. Um, their first broadcast was of the landslide victory by Warren G. Harding in the presidential um, election. So uh, if you will remind me in class, I have a, a uh, a recording of that first broadcast by KDKA Radio um, out of Pittsburgh. Here you see the historical marker, world's first commercial station, November 2nd, 1920. Um, now, local radio would be uh, would become very popular, okay? but it was the development of network radio that really spurred radio into... Um, the entertainment industry that it would become. Right? The first national radio network was NBC, National Broadcasting Corporation. NBC still around today, as you know. Um, and radio in the 1920s was not what you would think of it as today. Radio sets were huge contraptions. Look at the picture at the bottom of the slide here. Okay? This was a radio set. They were huge models that would sit in your living room and the whole family would gather around the uh, the radio to listen to programming. Okay? Radio kind of helped bring people back home when the automobile had pulled them away. Okay? Early automobiles didn't have radio in them. Um, this is what radio was, these giant contraptions here. Okay? Families would sit around and listen to radio programming and then the nice thing about network radio was that everybody in the country listened to the same thing at the same time. So whether you were in New York City or small town mid-America, Iowa, or on the West Coast, you could all be listening to the same radio program at the same time. That helps kind of unify, bring some unity to this country. Right? The fact that farmers, city people, factory workers, business owners, everybody, no matter who it was, listen to the same radio programs. So it kind of helps bring the country together. Right? Radio will also have a big influence on politics. Right? Um, as suddenly, um, presidential candidates, especially, had to sound like they knew what they were talking about. Um, they would campaign on the radio. So you would hear broadcasts from the guy trying to get your vote. Right? So um, what this does is it gives people in, let's say, the South an idea what a Northern candidate actually sounds like. You don't just read about him in the newspaper. Now you have to hear him. So you have to sound presidential. People with thick, thick accents, whether it's northern or southern or whatever, um, suddenly we're going to have problems getting votes in other parts of the country. Okay? So uh, the radio will greatly affect how politics plays out. Okay? Um, flappers. Okay? Flappers was a nickname for the young, modern woman of the 20s. Okay. Um, these are young women, not old women, young women in the 20s. Okay. Um, they get their nickname from their shoes. Okay. They wore uh, black leather shoes with big buckles on them. But like most of you all like to do, you just shove your foot into a shoe and don't bother tying your shoe. Uh, flappers would put their shoes on and leave them unbuckled so that they, when they walked around, the buckle flapped up and down. So they get the nickname flappers from the sound their shoes made. Okay? These are young, modern women of the 20s. 
Um, here you see sort of a, a speakeasy picture from the 20s. This is a, sort of a, a, a typical flapper image here, okay? Um, short dresses, short hair, bobbed off, um, high heels, okay? They wear makeup. Um, but typically the way flappers are described, okay, is uh, sort of a combination of masculine and feminine traits. They combine masculine and feminine traits, okay? Now, I'm, I'm not saying they're, they're, they're lesbians or anything like that, no, right? While, but while being fully female, they did things that typically only men had done in the past, give you some examples. Um, they smoked in public. Women did not smoke in public, but it was common to go into a speakeasy uh, and see a woman sitting there smoking a cigarette. They drank in public. Women never had dinner drinks. Suddenly, in speakeasies, thanks to prohibition, everybody drank, right? Um, they talked openly about sex. Men would sit around and brag of their sexual conquest and all of that. Women never did that. It just wasn't considered proper. Now women are doing it too. So these are young women who wear short skirts, makeup, cut their hair short, talked about sex, smoked and drank, things that only men had done in the past. So they combined kind of masculine and feminine traits. Right? Now the typical image of a flapper the ideal image, sorry, the ideal image of the flapper was a woman named Clara Bow, B-O-W. Uh, and here in the bottom left, you see a picture of Clara Bow. She was a movie star. That was silent movies at this time. Uh, but Clara Bow was the young flapper in the movies. Um, you know, the, the, the sex symbol. Think of the, you know, the biggest sex symbol nowadays, the hottest girl in the movies, whatever. Clara Bow was the 1920s version of that. Okay? She's sometimes known as the It Girl uh, because she stars in a movie called It. No, it's not the one with the clowns. That's much later. All right? um, but Clara Bow would be that, that prototypical image of the flapper, the one all the women were trying to look like. Okay? Now, while women are in the speakeasies, smoking and drinking and dancing the night of the way, the music they're dancing to is jazz. Jazz music becomes the new sound of the decade. Um, jazz makes its way up from New Orleans, uh, along with blacks migrating during World War I, coming north looking for factory jobs. Okay. Um, they bring with them their music. Okay. Jazz is a combination of lots of different things. Uh, some country, uh, some bluegrass, um, uh, some gospel um, from the slaves and so forth. Um, it's, it's this mishmash, this hodgepodge of all different kinds of music. Jazz, uh, and specifically later we'll get into different forms of it, but it's typically free form. Uh, you get four or five people together, a little jazz quintet, um, and they just start playing and come up with a song. Rarely does the, sound, the same song sound the same way twice. Because uh, they just there's no sheet music. You just play it and see what comes of it. Um, but uh, although it's black music, blacks don't make a lot of money off of it. Um, because that's not how society went. White bands would copy the style and profit as blacks could not. Uh, again, look at this picture here, right? The, 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 the white guy here playing um, the piano and the white guys in the band back here playing horns, right? Um, whites would make a lot of music or, and a lot of money off of jazz. Um, blacks wouldn't, even though they are the originators of it. Right? Um, now, jazz thrived, really, in areas where blacks congregated. Uh, and that was never more true anywhere than it was in Harlem. And we need to talk about a very important event here known as the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, a renaissance is kind of a rebirth, a change, okay? Um, and we're talking about a, a rebirth of the black community. Okay? Um, 
Blacks, when they migrated north, settled in the big cities. New York City had the largest congregation. And the biggest collection of blacks in New York City settled in uh, the borough of Harlem. Um, Now, when you get that many people together with a common traumatic background, uh, a background of, of slavery and segregation and discrimination and violence, Um, when you get that many people together, hundreds of thousands, who have all shared that same horrible background, you get them all together in one place, one of two things is going to happen. All that energy is going to come out in one of two different ways. Either it comes out in violence or it comes out creatively. Well, thankfully, it comes out creatively. The Harlem Renaissance is this artistic and cultural rebirth, an artistic and cultural rebirth. Um, Blacks in Harlem start writing and singing and painting and sculpting um, and acting this shared experience. They start writing books about what it was like to come from a slave background. They start singing songs that will eventually become the blues, a form of jazz. They start painting uh, these these beautiful paintings, expressions of that sorrow that they're coming out of. Um, The Harlem Renaissance is this huge artistic explosion, a cultural and artistic explosion. Uh, Singers, writers, poets, uh, painters all come out of this, this shared experience. One of the biggest names that you need to know is a man named Langston Hughes, uh, probably the most well-known writer. Uh, He was mainly a poet, but he wrote some too. Um, But the the, the most well-known writer to come out of uh, the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, But this is the high point um, for African-American art uh, and music uh, in the United States.